Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I was delighted when President Heckler invited me to provide the brief introduction this morning. I was delighted, first of all, because of who our speaker is. Fred Lawrence, Secretary and CEO of the Phi Beta Kappa Society, and second of all, because of you, the representatives to the New American Colleges and Universities Summer Institute. There is a connection in my mind between Fred Lawrence and the NACU, ANAC to me, that neither President Heckler nor Fred Lawrence could have known about. Some 25 years ago, after Valparaiso University had submitted several unsuccessful applications in a row to the Phi Beta Kappa Society, we desperately wanted to shelter a chapter, I traveled to Washington, D.C. to speak with one of Fred's predecessors to find out what we might do to better our chances. I learned quickly that many members of Phi Beta Kappa did not have a good understanding of the comprehensive university. There were plenty of Phi Beta Kappa chapters in small liberal arts colleges, like Williams College, and plenty of chapters at world-renowned R1 institutions, like Yale University. But what about a place like Valpo, a small university that integrated liberal and professional education and was dedicated to civic engagement? In short, what about NACU institutions? After a lengthy conversation with this previous Phi Beta Kappa secretary, I was convinced that a key to our next application lay in explaining carefully what Valpo's mission as a comprehensive university was. I don't know if that was the key to the application, but the next time around, Valpo was invited to shelter a chapter and to bestow the Phi Beta Kappa key on our best students. So Fred, I guess I'm suggesting that your presence here today affirms and confirms that schools like, Val like Valpo and all the other NACUs represented here today are just the right colleges and universities to bring into the Phi Beta Kappa fold. Fred Lawrence was selected to be secretary and CEO of the Phi Beta Kappa Society just over one year ago, after having dis a distinguished career in education and education administration. He was inducted into Phi Beta Kappa at Williams College and is a graduate of Yale Law School where he also served as senior research scholar before joining the Phi Beta Kappa team in Washington. He was president and professor of politics at Brandeis University, where he ensured the future of the Rose Art Museum and raised over $250 million in support of a wide range of programs. He has also taught at the George Washington University Law School and at the Boston University School of Law. Fred is uniquely prepared to address the topic of this year's Summer Institute, Dialogue and Understanding, Conversations Across Difference. He has written extensively, lectured internationally, and testified before Congress on bias crimes and freedom of expression, and is the author of Punishing Hate, Bias Crimes Under American Law, published by Harvard University already 15 years ago. News sources, CNN, The Huffington Post, MSNBC Online, for example, call on Fred Lawrence when they need someone reliable and steady to comment on biased crimes. His topic today is The Contours of Expression, Free Speech and Civility. Please join me in welcoming Fred Lawrence. Uh, one of the things that is extraordinary about Phi Beta Kappa, we have 286 chapters, uh, which depending on how you look at it is large or small, it's fewer than 10% of the colleges and universities in the country, um, and yet it is an astonishingly diverse group of schools. Uh, we are big and we are small, we are public and we are private, we are non-sectarian and we are faith-based. 
what we share, what we represent, are the schools that are committed to the liberal tradition of learning and liberal arts and sciences. It turns out that taverns were the place where most of the revolutionary ideas and movements in this country were started. It was the semi-public place where one could gather outside of the prying eyes and ears of the crown. And so they gathered committed to a radical revolutionary idea, Philosophia Bio Kubernetes, which we usually translate as love of learning as the guide of life. But in fact, there are classicists in the room. Oh good, then I can make it up. Um, <laughs> Uh, Kubernetes um, actually has a, um, a maritime or nautical connotation in classical Greek literature. So it actually is better translated as love of learning is the, is the pilot of life or the, or the helmsman of life. And it's a subtle but significant difference because the guide, after all, takes you on a path that already exists. The helmsman steers you out into the water where there is no path. And sometimes the waters feel a little choppy, like the times in which we're living. And the path appears very difficult to find indeed. And so they were dedicated to the radical idea on December 5th of 1776 that the love of learning would be the helmsman of life. And that what they were particularly committed to was a notion that through liberal education and debate and robust discussion in the arts, humanities, and sciences would come the deepest bonds of fellowship. And so located right in that moment in the Raleigh Tavern, 240 plus years ago, this is, this, this is the universal symbol that I'm supposed to be standing someplace else. And I want to use this or I don't want to use this? I do want to use this. Now we're on the air. Oh, I was told that this was going to do something. Oh, I see. Okay. I haven't said anything important yet. <laughs> that what would come from that debate was the deepest form of fellowship. This is known to us today, 240 years later, as the tension between free expression and civility, an issue that continues to occupy our campuses. And so it is most appropriate that as part of your discussion of conversations about difference is how do we have discussions that are really about difference, which is to say not to go to such a high level of abstraction that we can all agree on everything. Those discussions feel good in the moment, but it's like filling your hand with moonlight. In the morning, it's gone. But at the same time, the core notion of an academic institution is one that is based on civility and mutual respect. Now, President Heckler knows that the thing that presidents fear most when you speak publicly is getting caught repeating a story. So I was taught, and I'm sure you were too, the best way not to repeat a story is just tell new ones. And you get them all the time. So the last time that I was privileged to testify before Congress on these issues, was, is today still Thursday? Yes, uh, it was Tuesday. A hearing before the Senate Judiciary Committee on questions of free expression on campus. And one of the things that came through that hearing was the, in my view, danger of oversimplifying the question and particularly by those who, and I do mean this with due respect, but also to challenge who spend little, if any, time on campus. Because it's very easy in the cheap seats to decide how things ought to happen on campus. But those of you who spend your life in these vineyards know what I'm talking about. I will just tell you, as an aside, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons. In the first frame, you can see that it's about the, the eighth inning of a baseball game Runners are on second and third, and you can see the scoreboard in the far frame tie game, and you can see who's up at bat, big burly guys up at bat. Second frame, the manager calls a timeout, and the third frame, he walks over to the owner's box, and the caption in the fourth frame of this bar cartoon is, 
Do I pitch to him or do I walk him? Today, not tomorrow, today. It's easy tomorrow to know what you should have done yesterday. The hard thing is, what do you do in the moment? So I'm about to share with you three stories, some of which go back a little ways in time. But I'm going to start before those three with one from yesterday, so I can't get caught repeating the story. Those of you who wake up as I do and read Inside Higher Ed, even before you get out of bed, I know if I had an analyst, he'd tell me don't do that. that that's one of the reasons I don't. I don't want somebody to tell me not to do that, so there you are. Um, we'll know the story already. Trinity, outside of Hartford, has got themselves a problem with a faculty member who posted a uh, pretty provocative story online along with his own comments with it. It was a story about the fact that among the heroes of the tragic event not far from where I live in Washington, D.C., in the shooting at the Republican congressional baseball practice, among the heroes was a police officer who was a uh, African-American lesbian. An article was written that said, Representative Scalise has no use and has done nothing to help the LGBTQ community, so, here's the punchline, she should have let him effing die. Only it didn't say effing, it spelled it out. And this faculty member posts that with hashtag, let them effing die. So um, we were just saying before, as president of a university, you walk into the office with the 10 things on your mind that you think you're gonna get to that day, and then somebody pulls you aside and says, Mr. President, something just happened, and all of a sudden those things aren't what's going to happen. So we'll talk later about how the president responded. And I'm happy to say in this case, I think she got it just right. I think she got it just right and I wish her strength in maintaining her course because the pressure will be unbearable. But when you are in those choppy waters, it is the love of learning that will be the helmsman of life. So the first story I wanna share with you goes back um, just about the time my Hate Crimes book came out, I was giving a talk at University College London on free speech and free expression and the limits of free speech, where it turns into hate speech or hate crimes. And a professor with a, right out of central casting, charcoal, gray suit, handkerchief, um, and, a, and an accent I shall not attempt to imitate, says to me, what would you do if a group of skinheads took a truck, a lorry, he would say, mark it up with racist slogans and drive it right into the heart of Brixton? a neighborhood at the time that was overwhelmingly still predominantly um, African British and Caribbean British community. What would you do? And I began to tease out some of the analysis that I'll share with you momentarily about how do we think about these, where is the limit on expression, where do we say something has crossed the line. He stops me in the middle and says, why is this so hard for you? We all know it's wrong. Why is this so hard for you? So that's the first story. Second story is just about a decade ago. Before I was a university president myself, I was dean of a law school in Washington, D.C., and I was a trustee at Williams College, where I attended. President of the college calls me up with the following question, conundrum. A Jewish student had just woken up to find on her door a flyer pasted on her dorm room uh, door that was a, an eviction notice. You must vacate this room by five o'clock today, otherwise it will be, um, it and all its contents will be destroyed. Obviously this was a, a faux eviction notice meant to ape the issues that arise when the Israeli Defense Forces put such notices on the homes of Palestinian families who are either accused of being or related to terrorists. Uh, on the, on the West Bank. By the way, just a little kicker here that, that I think you will appreciate as I did. It also said, all costs that are attributed to this will be put on your student account. I thought that was a nice touch that a Williams student must have thought of. So obviously, I'm making light, but obviously this young woman was very, very upset when she got this. What can we do about this, he says to me. All right, that's the second story. And then the third story is closer to home. 
Uh, it's during the time I was president of Brandeis. This is in the aftermath of the killings in Ferguson and Baltimore. And you will recall that not long after that, there was the murder of two police officers in New York, uh, ostensibly in retaliation for the killings in Ferguson and Baltimore. A young woman on our campus, head of the Black Lives Matters movement at Brandeis, tweets out, I have no sympathy for the police officers and their families. Now, I knew that's not really what she meant. The reason I knew that is that I actually knew this young woman reasonably well. And I had met her, in fact, the first time earlier that semester when she had organized our Ferguson vigil at which I spoke, and she introduced my head of police on campus. So I knew she was no cop hater. What she meant was, how come when an African American is killed in Ferguson, Missouri, to her view, nobody or not enough attention is, no, nobody cares or not enough attention is paid, and when two cops are killed, the whole world comes to a standstill. But that's not what she said. What she said was, I have no sympathy for the families of those police officers. And those of you with familiarity with university life know what happens next. Uh, she had about 60 followers on Twitter, by the way, that's all. So this is roughly the pre-social media equivalent of saying it in the dining hall. Except, unlike the dining hall, it only takes one troll to pick it up, put it on social media, which this young man did put it on a, uh, I think it's fair to describe it as a, uh, a right-wing website, what I would call a heresy-chasing website, and then it goes viral. And from the moment it goes viral, my life turns inside out because I start getting it 360. Those who say, you have to give a full-throated support of her right to say what she wants to say, and those who say she should be thrown out of school, she should lose her scholarship money, interesting that they assumed that she was on scholarship, and some of that came from people who couldn't recognize or pick out Brandeis on a map. And some of it came from members of my board of trustees. So that's the third story. So let's talk a little bit about free speech, free expression, and we'll pick up each of these stories as we go along and we'll wind up in, outside of Hartford and talk a little bit about Trinity. Why is this so hard for us? Well, it's hard for us because the whole idea of free expression is a core, if not the core value of the American Republic, going back to what I said about Phi Beta Kappa to begin with, founded in the same year as the United States of America. And it's particularly true at university campuses because as diverse as the schools within Phi Beta Kappa, as I said, are and across our whole country, I do believe we are united at some level of abstraction by the following mission, which is the creation and discovery of knowledge and the transmission of that knowledge to, through our teaching and through our scholarship for the betterment of our local, national, and even international communities. That is a sacred mission, and that is what we get to do every day. That mission requires within it a robust system of free expression. Scientific inquiry itself is based on the notion of refutability, based on the notion that I test my theory by saying, here are propositions that can be tested and which may turn out to be wrong. But I put those out there to be debated, and I expect them to be debated. And sometimes I expect that debate to have a pointy end on the end of the stick. And that through that process will come not the truth as a static moment, but the process of truth seeking to which we are all dedicated. That is the heart of liberal education. That concept is incoherent without a robust system of free expression. And so it is not merely the American Republic generally that requires free expression and free speech, but it is particularly our campuses and our academic enterprise. So when my 
British interlocutor said, we all know it's wrong, that rang tin to my American ears. Because we don't use that expression, we all know it's wrong, so you don't get to say it. Even if we would wish that we and maybe all right-thinking people would criticize certain behavior. We don't say it's all wrong. That's why they had to gather in the Raleigh Tavern, because there was a system where somebody did tell them what was right and wrong, and they had to gather outside of that. So that's why this is hard for us, and that's why, as a general matter, we take speech extremely seriously. This normative argument resonates strongly with First Amendment jurisprudence in this country, and there are many ways in which this can be represented. It's interesting that a man named Fred Vinson, who was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, um, briefly in the mid-late 1940s, very early 1950s, hardly a liberal and hardly thought of as an advocate of free speech, saw no need even to cite a case or authority for the proposition that the guiding light of our jurisprudence is that no one can be punished for holding a particular idea. Vincent, just as an aside, uh, Vincent was the Chief Justice at the time that Brown against Board of Education was heard for the first time. Many people don't know that it was re-argued a second time. What we think of as Brown was actually the second time it was argued. It was put down for re-argument the following year with the summer of 1954 intervening. And it was actually during that summer that Fred Vincent passed away. Earl Warren famously is appointed to replace him, and of course the rest of the story we know. Uh, Felix Frankfurter famously said that the death of Fred Vincent was the first proof positive he ever had in the existence of God. Um, I just leave that to you. Um, so Vincent himself understood the value of free expression. Think of it in the context of flag burning. Every time flag burning has been tested in the United States Supreme Court, even as the court has become more conservative on so many issues. Recently as the late 1980s, I think 1989, Texas against Johnson, Supreme Court strikes down the Texas flag burning statute. With all of the obligatory language, and I think they mean this deeply, that it is, it is reprehensible to them to think about burning an American flag. And I will tell you personally, I find, I, I, it's not just that I find it um, activity I disagree with. I, I have a visceral reaction to seeing the flag burn. Nonetheless, protected expressive activity. It's the reason that campus speech codes, which first really came into, into play, not in the recent period, but in the, in the 1980s, early mid 1980s, routinely campus speech codes were struck down as unconstitutional. Again, for the same reason, that we don't regulate speech in general and we don't put things in the plus or minus category of speech and say, because we disagree, it is prohibited. So that's why it's so hard for us. But is there a limit? And where does speech activity cross over into something that in the criminal law we say, could say could be criminalized, where it becomes something akin not to hate speech, discriminatory speech, which I would say ought to be protected and becomes a hate crime where it has actually crossed over a line. Or on our campus communities where criminal liability is not typically what we're talking about, we're talking about that which can be sanctioned, uh, that which can lead to uh, suspension or perhaps even expulsion. When does it cross over? So let me start with a digression down a, a blind alley only because it is a very popularly uh, articulated blind alley. And that is the idea of distinguishing speech from conduct. We distinguish speech from conduct, the theory goes, speech is protected, conduct is not. Uh, this is the old saw that, uh, that you've heard of, you know, my right to swing my hand ends where your chin begins. Right? I can sticks and stones will break your bones, but, you know, uh, but words will never hurt you, so I can use words, but I can't throw sticks and stones. Um, it, it's not just a distinction that has a kind of uh, appeal to, to us trying to figure out how do you make decisions when you're the, the, the dean of students, the, the provost, <coughs> the dean of the college, the president of the university. But it has an appeal to the United States Supreme Court. 
My area of research, um, as you heard uh, in the overly generous introduction, um, was bias, is bias-motivated violence, but I say was uh, in the 19, early 1990s, really this, the, what we call the hate crimes project of trying to get onto the landscape the notion that there should be laws, uh, federal laws, state laws, that allow for the enhanced punishment of bias-motivated crimes and then arguing out various of the issues, how do you square that with First Amendment doctrine? This was a number of us working on this project in the, uh, in the early 1990s. Uh, there was a case called uh, RAV against City of St. Paul. RAV is the initials of a, of a minor, so his name was kept out of it, uh, kept out of the case at the time. Robert Victoria is his name. Uh, after he became 18, of course, he could become public. Um, testing the constitutionality of the cross-burning statute in Minneapolis, St. Paul that made it a crime to burn a cross in public. It was struck down by the Supreme Court, and it could have been struck down on the grounds that it was over-inclusive, that it was vague, what was involved, uh, depending on where and what that activity meant. But the court actually used language that suggested that you can't punish a crime differently because of the motivation of the actor, specifically the biased motivation of the actor. To many of us, this was a particular concern because it looked for a, a little bit there as if the entire project of bias crimes had just been declared unconstitutional. If you'll forgive me a point of personal privilege, this takes place exactly during the years when I am coming up for tenure. <laughs> so all of a sudden, I'm watching my field get declared unconstitutional. This was no small matter. Um, the Supreme Court changed grounds in a case I was actually privileged to be involved in called Wisconsin against Mitchell, decided in 1993, which upheld the Wisconsin hate crime statute. The way in which the court decided unanimously was distinguishing speech from conduct. They said the cross-burning case was about expression and therefore it was protected and this Wisconsin case is about conduct and therefore that can be struck down. Um, this is when you find out whether you're a lawyer or you're a scholar. The lawyer in me was happy with the win. The scholar with me was appalled at the thin reasoning of this, of this case. Because the truth is, you cannot distinguish speech from conduct in any meaningful way. Speech is a kind of expressive conduct. Or suppose that I hold up a, a poster. Is this speech or is this conduct? Or, to use an example meaningful to some of us of a certain generation in the room, suppose you burn a draft card. Is that speech, expressive activity, or is that conduct? The best description of it goes to the great legal scholar John Hart Healy, who wrote a very influential piece about the draft card burning case in which the United States Supreme Court upheld the criminalization of burning draft cards. Remember, they had struck down the laws of flag burning, but upheld burning a draft card, possibly because the real crime was not having a draft card on you, but there are a lot of ways of not having, which, which was the law, for those of you who don't know, you were actually required until you were 26 as a young man to carry your draft card at all times. Um, but that was a law that nobody was enforcing. It was only being enforced in the, in the burning context. And everybody knew why draft cards were being burned. It was a, something one did at an anti-war rally. It was the most dramatic way to demonstrate opposition to the Vietnam War. So John Hart Ely described the activity of burning a draft card as 100% speech and 100% conduct. Inextricable and incoherent to try to distinguish. And in fact, it really turns out to be a classic example of putting the rabbit in the hat before pulling it out. Because in a perfect tautology, that which you wish to protect, you will call speech. And that which you wish to punish, you will call conduct. No predictability, and in fact, totally self-reinforcing. So, what is a better way to try to think about this? And the better way to try to think about this, I think, really goes back to first year, first year um, law school, and we actually have in our midst the uh, spouse of one of my students in the first year. Uh, and I had him for civil procedure, so uh, he will recall that I also taught criminal law. So you could tell him I tried to give an example involving uh, collateral estoppel and race judicata, but it just didn't fit in. Um, so this is an example from the criminal law. Basic criminal law, and I will in the next 30 seconds give you the first week of a basic criminal law class. 
All crimes constitute two parts, the mental piece, the act piece, the act called the actus reus in the Latin term, the mental piece being the mens rea. You need both the intent for a crime as well as the physical act to carry that crime out. And it has to be voluntary and it has to cause a harm uh, and be intended to cause that harm. Right? That's the basic rudimentary elements of a crime. So when I've talked about this to, to groups including um, high school and grade school groups all the way up to professional audiences, um, I usually give the following you know, very quick hypothetical to illustrate the point. Suppose I told you, suppose I told you that, that one person took a bat, baseball bat, and hit another person in the head, swung it intentionally, hit another person in the head very hard, big welt on the person's head, actually knocked him unconscious briefly. What crime has been committed? And typically people will say assault, assault with a deadly weapon, attempted murder, until one person typically says, you haven't given us enough facts. And that would be correct. Because now I shall add two very important facts. The person with the bat was standing like this. And the person who got hit was standing like this. So what have I changed? Obviously, I've changed the mental state of the person swinging the bat. Of course, he's intentionally swinging the bat. But at worst, it is accidental that he hit the catcher in the head. It may not even have been an accident. It might have been one of those, I mean, accident in the colloquial sense, meaning that nobody did anything wrong. It may not even have been negligent. But it certainly was not what we call reckless. Classic definition of reckless is consciously disregarding a substantial and unjustifiable risk. This is not that. At most, this is negligent if he was standing too close to the catcher. And maybe it's just one of those things that happens. But think about it. The physical manifestation is exactly the same. The physical harm is exactly the same. And we would say two things about this. One is we would say the blameworthiness is different, obviously, from the person who intentionally attempted to inflict harm, as opposed to the person who, at worst, negligently and maybe simply accidentally swung back too far. But it's not just the blameworthiness that's different. We know from psychological studies and evidence, the harm is actually different. Even if the physical manifestations are the same, the harm of a purposeful attack on you is much greater than of the reckless act, than of the negligent act, than just of the accidental act. Or as the great justice Oliver Wendell Holmes put it, even a dog knows the difference between being tripped over and being kicked. And if a dog knows the difference, how much more do we know the difference between being tripped over and being kicked? between accidentally being harmed between pur and purposely being assaulted, and between being assaulted for a particular reason, not because of where you are, but because of what you are, because of who you are. It's a kind of spirit murdering that comes in a bias-motivated act. So if we distinguish speech, not speech from conduct, but purposeful attempt to commit harm, as opposed to intent to express oneself, then we begin to see a different kind of framework for thinking about how we can distinguish that which we would protect and that which we would not. Let me give three examples that will make the point. The third of which will be the Williams case that I mentioned at the beginning. The two cases before that both come from the same Supreme Court case, another one of these cross-burning statutes, this one in Virginia, a case called Virginia against Black. Virginia against Black tested the cross-burning statute in Virginia that did the following two things. And I illustrate that they're two different things because the court is going to uphold one piece, strike down the other. The court said that a racially motivated assault, a racially motivated intimidation, should be punished at a higher level than a non-racially motivated assault or intimidation. That's standard hate crime stuff which had been upheld 10 years earlier in the Wisconsin case I told you about. The second piece it said is that if you burn a cross, it shall be presumptive. We should presume that you had racial animus as your intent. Right there, the court said, that goes too far. And here are the two cases in Virginia against Black they used to illustrate the point. Two different cases. One, garden variety Ku Klux Klan rally. 
at the conclusion of which they burn a big flaming cross. If you've never seen this done in person, it is chilling. Chilling. But it is an expression of hateful, bigoted, reprehensible views, in my view. Nonetheless, it is expression of those views. As opposed to what? The other case involved two neighbors, black family, white family. The black family had raised an objection to the fact that the white family was using their backyard for, among other things, target practice. I'm sorry, I couldn't make this up. Those are the actual evidence from the white family that they were just using it for target practice, shooting guns into their backyard. Black family, needless to say, objected vociferously, went to the authorities, and before it was done, the white family had burned a cross on the lawn of the black family. There, the court said, there, the burning of the cross in that context clearly is evidence of racial animus, racial intimidation. So they upheld the part of the statute that said, when it is racial intimidation, evidence, then it can be used to enhance the penalty. But where it's not, then it's expression of views. So what is the court looking for the distinction? They asked, what's in the state of the mind of the actor? Is that easy to do? Not always easy to do, but sometimes easier than one would think. Which brings us back to the case of Williams. So the president said to me, what should we do about this young woman who is complaining about this flyer that she found on her door? So he and I talked a little bit about Virginia against black and the role of mens rea or intent. And he said, how on earth will we know what the intent was of the people who put that flyer up? I said, well, for starters, let's find out how those flyers were distributed. Was she the only one who had a flyer put on her door? Were they only put on the doors of leaders, identifiable leaders of the Jewish community at Williams? Or, as turned out to be the case, were they put on the doors of everybody in West College, everybody in that dorm? That being the case, it looks a lot like what you have is a effort dramatically, one might even say thoughtlessly, to articulate a very deeply held political view about the situation in the Middle East and the controversy between Israel and Palestine. In which case, you don't have activity that ought to be sanctioned because you have protected activity. Trying to figure out what we do in the criminal law all the time, and honestly, what we do on campus quite a bit as well. What was in the mind of the actor? What were they trying to do? What were they trying to accomplish? I will also tell you at this point, as I sort of move seamlessly between the criminal law and constitutional law on the one hand, campuses on the other, there is one enormous difference that not only we have to hold on to, but we have to articulate at every possible turn. Our colleges and our universities are educative institutions. They are not penal institutions. When we face challenges, our first instinct should always be, how do we educate our students? That's what we're about. I'll tell you the way in which I used to describe this to my, my board. Dwight Eisenhower, during the Second World War, uh, Eisenhower was one of the masters of tactics, strategy, mission, and organizing how this enormous enterprise of the Allied forces would be directed. On his desk during the Second World War, he kept a card of mission, strategy, tactics to enforce that strategy, implement that strategy. And the mission was win the war. He said when he had a hard decision to make, he refracted it through the lens of, is this helping me win the war? And of course, when you tell that to a room, people tend to smile, nod. But here's the kicker. Okay, friends, what's our version of win the war? We, we better have that clear in our mind. I told you mine at the beginning. Creation and discovery of knowledge and the transmission of that knowledge through our teaching and our scholarship for the betterment of our local, national, and international communities. And then you refract everything through that lens. It won't answer every question all the time, obviously. I'm not trying to be naive. But it does have an amazing quality to focus us on the things that matter. And the instinct of punishing a student, sure, we punish students sometimes. 
That's not fundamental to what we do. That's instrumental to what we do. What's fundamental to what we do is the education of our students. So I would argue that we start with a strong presumption, not an irrebuttable presumption, but a strong presumption that speech is protected. That means that students and faculty are free to write and say what they write and say, that outside speakers, if they are invited to campus by campus groups, are free to come and speak. State university, depending on the rules of the state university, maybe if they're not even invited, because it's considered a public space. Strong presumption in favor of free expression. The borders, the edge, being based not on a speech conduct distinction that will ultimately be ephemeral, but rather on an effort to distinguish between when the speaker is expressing and when the speaker is using words to threaten, to intimidate, and to cause what we could call a verbal assault. It's not a speech conduct distinction. Words can be used to harm every bit as much as physical conduct can. Words should be thought of as expressive conduct. And so now, let me turn to the last piece I'd like to talk about, which in some ways is the most subtle and to me the easiest to lose and the most important to grasp. Now that we've said that most expressive activity will be protected and we have some flavor for where it will be restricted, is there really nothing more to be said about hateful, harmful, expressive activity other than to say that it's protected? Is that really all there is to say? Do you remember the art exhibition at, Uni at uh, Cincinnati, Cincinnati Art Museum of Robert Maplethorpe's work? Some of you will recall this story. Robert Maplethorpe's work is not everybody's cup of tea. Some of it is pretty edgy, pretty provocative stuff. Uh, and the good and the great of Cincinnati uh, decided that this was inappropriate and they should shut it down. Maplethorpe predictably sued to have it reopened, it being a public art museum, and the court upheld his right under the First Amendment that his art should be exhibited. The art critic Robert Hughes wrote a wonderful essay in the New York Review of Books shortly thereafter. Maybe it takes somebody from outside the United States to have this perspective. He said, Americans tend to over-constitutionalize questions, as if the only important question is whether Maplethorpe's work is constitutionally protected. And Hughes, to be a little provocative himself, said, of course it's constitutionally pro protected, and I don't find that to be a very interesting question. I'm sorry, I find it to be a very interesting question. Um, but I agree with Hughes that it's not the only interesting question, and I actually agree with Hughes that in this context it's not the most interesting question. Hughes said the most interesting question for him as an art critic was the aesthetic question. To actually evaluate the work, of course he's got the right to exhibit it. Now let's talk about whether any of it's any good. And he liked some of it, and he actually took some of it apart in a pretty focused, at least to my non-professional eye, you know, well-argued, well-analyzed um, piece of art criticism. So I think particularly in residential colleges, but colleges generally, we have a similar version of that. If the only question we ask is whether expressive activity is protected, then we have limited our discussion in a very dangerous way because we have not asked the more important question of how should we respond to this. Which brings me to my story from Brandeis. So recall the young woman in her tweet saying that she had no sympathy for the families of these police officers who've been assassinated. And as I said to you, um, I got lots of, lots of free advice as to what I should, should do in that situation. And I thought what I'd been presented with was an impoverished choice set. There was no way that I was going to dismiss her from school or take away her scholarship for expressive activity. Totally antithetical to the notion of a college or a university, in my view. And I told my supporters, donors, strangers the same. On the other hand, it seemed to me merely saying free expression covers this entire question also did not cover it. And so I issued my own statement in which I said she has free 
right of free expression. She has the right to tweet what she wants to tweet. Uh, we stand by that right and we protect her from those who would seek to cause her harm, physical or psychological, for exercising that right. But I also have a right of free speech and although used carefully and rarely in the role of the president on behalf of the university, I said this expression is inconsistent with the highest values of this university. Now you know what happens next. You get a 360 when you do that. But the goal was to take a dictum that my great hero Louis Brandeis said as a alternative to repression and turn it into a moral obligation, by which I mean the following. Brandeis famously wrote that in the cases of bad speech, with the rare exception of where that speech is intended to cause imminent lawless activity, with that very rare exception, that's the group, that's what we talked about being way out on the horizon. The answer is not enforced silence, Brandeis said, it is more speech. And to me, we are living in a time where the obligation of more speech is not merely an option, it is an obligation. It is a moral obligation. Let me give you another example. Also, during my time as president of Brandeis, there was a group of faculty that had a listserv that they thought was password protected. Um, it was a little bit of the equivalent of uh, the front door was locked, but the back door was, you know, required you to really to pull. Yeah, it was password protected in the sense you had to put in your own university username and password and then you could get into it. There was no special password for it. Uh, by and large, they communicated within themselves as president. I saw, you know, all the stuff that went through. So I, I, I knew more or less what they were, what they were doing on it. And, and it was uh, some, pretty, some pretty horrific stuff. Um, their political views were their political views. The way in which they were said was, was pretty, pretty grotesque uh, stuff, a lot of it. Um, about Israel, which is particularly sensitive to a lot of the supporters of Brandeis. Um, a lot of it ad hominem at my predecessor and his spouse. And as I said, it wasn't just that it was critical, it was, it was vulgar and it was, it was disgusting, I think, by any, you know, any objective measure. Um, all protected activity, to be sure. Um, which is why when I saw it, I just exercised my right to delete and, and go on with my day. But, one faculty member who knew about it, who was interested in exposing um, those faculty involved and the university generally, uh, tipped off a student, hey, it was the same student who put that young woman's tweet online. Isn't that something? You know, it doesn't take many people with one of these to cause a lot of impact anymore, does it? So this student went on into the, web, into the uh, listserv and uh, copied, pasted, and put it up on either the same or another right-wing website, and that too went viral. Same kind of story, same kind of options, only in this case it's board members, many of them. These faculty members should be sanctioned, they should have their salaries frozen, they should lose tenure, they should be fired, the whole, the whole bit. And faculty members saying <clears throat> that this calls for robust protection of free speech. Um, I don't want you to think I did these on a daily basis. In fact, I've now given you the two examples of my entire time as president. Uh, a wise president does not call First Amendment balls and strikes on a daily basis. Um, you, you debase the currency of the presidency if you do that, and you also lose your uh, ability to say there's uh, free, robust expression on campus. But you pick your spots. Um, and this was the other one for me. The reactions were interesting to me. The trustees who had pushed particularly hard on throwing these faculty out said to me, you're issuing a statement that said that this listserv presents the university in a false and a bad light and is inconsistent with the highest values of Brandeis University. That means nothing. Nobody cares about your little statements, Mr. President. If you want to do something, you've got to really do something that's got some teeth to it. In my business, law firm, hospital, Etc. we would fill in the blank, and that's how they'd know we meant something. You can't just issue a little statement. That's over here. Later that day, I met with the faculty involved. You've chilled our speech, they say. So they obviously did feel that it had some impact. In fact, they thought it had too much impact. So I'll tell you what I said to them. 
but you gotta let me get to the end of the paragraph. I said, not all chilling effects are bad. I told you I had to let me get to the end of the paragraph. Because anybody writes that down and runs out of the room, I just got soundbited to death. Right, somebody's about to tweet, Lawrence says not all chilling effects are bad. There is the classic chilling effect by which we mean punishing people for expressing their views. That is pernicious, that is unconstitutional, that is inconsistent with the highest values of an academic enterprise for all the reasons we've just been talking about. Then there's another kind of chilling effect, if that's even the right word. That's the effect we have on each other. That's the way in which we influence each other. It is doing what Lincoln famously said when he said, teaching ourselves to listen to our better angels, is learning how to sing the song of our better angels to each other. That's a kind of effect we ought to have on each other. And so I said to these faculty members, you'd know what a real chilling effect is. You'd know if somebody was taking your tenure away. You'd know if somebody was flatlining your salary. That'll never happen as long as I'm president of this university. Your role here is your role here, and you're evaluated based on your teaching, your scholarship, and your service to the, com to the community. And that's how it should be. But what you're saying now is not a right of free expression. You want to be able to express yourself and not have me respond. You want words not to have consequences. I can't help you with that. Words have consequences. And sometimes I will respond. And when I do, sometimes I will disagree with you and you don't like that. And I guess, I guess I'm pleased that you don't like that. Because if you don't like that out of fear, then I'm not pleased. Then something's gone terribly amiss. But if you don't like that because you respect my views and you don't like the fact that I'm quarreling with you about something that's very serious, I guess that's a good thing. I guess that goes back to the Raleigh Tavern where they didn't agree to all agree. They agreed to debate, they agreed to argue, and they agreed to try to persuade each other. I said, and if you persuade me today that this whole way of looking at the world is wrong, then I will stop articulating this view. And I suppose you could say you have chilled my speech, but we wouldn't use that term. We would say you have influenced me. And we ought to seek to influence each other. So this morning, the president of Trinity in Hartford issued a statement to the community in which she said she'd spoken to the professor and she explained to him her sense that what he had done cast the university in a bad light and that it was reprehensible behavior. Let me see if I've actually got the language for you. You did wonder when I was actually gonna look at this thing, didn't you? Um, just bear with me. I want to underscore that what we seek to build is a diverse college community that is welcoming to all viewpoints and backgrounds and engages in civil discourse on even the most vexing issues. That requires that we continue to uphold our fundamental belief in academic freedom and support our community members' constitutional right to free speech. But our aspirations for the community, we want to also uh, demand that we take particular care with the words we use and the context in which we use them. This incident has caused distress on our campus and beyond. Uh, threats have violence have been directed to the professor and to our campus community, neither of which is acceptable response. I denounce hate speech in all forms. I will explore all options to resolve this matter, be back in touch with our community members with decisions. She said earlier in the piece that what he had written, that call was reprehensible and any such suggestion is abhorrent, wholly contrary to Trinity's values. Well, that's day one. I, I, I wish her strength through this time because I will tell you publicly what I would, would tell her privately, what I did tell another president just a few months ago in one of these situations. I said, I hope this doesn't sound condescending because it's really not intended to sound that way. It is the sound of somebody who's been there. Right now, you feel as if it will never end, that it's coming from you in all directions, and that the whole world is focused on. So let me assure you, it does end sooner than you think. 
most of the world couldn't find your college on a map and is not focused on it. And it is coming in all directions because that's what you do. You are at the center of that, that circle. When you are at the center of that circle, my experience is, it, is it's way too late to try to weigh the politics of it. No one's politics are good enough to do that. No one's political savvy is good enough to do that. When you do that, you've got to go back to first principles. And my first principles, and apparently hers, are that free speech is the overwhelming presumption that it hits a limit when we talk about certain kinds of intent, and even protected speech sometimes calls for more speech, a moral obligation to respond. And when one needs to find the quiet place to return to first principles, then it turns out, philosophia via Kubernetes, it turns out the love of learning is the helmsman of life. Thank you. I would be happy to take some questions, and I think we have some time, yes? We do, okay. Please. Okay, I haven't formulated it yet in my head uh, well enough. <laughs> I think, uh, first of all, I want to say I, I really like what you said and I, I, uh, your, your conversation today. And I actually think you gave us uh, your thoughts in such an accessible way that we might miss uh, how sophisticated your thinking on this is. Actually, I think you hit a lot of points um, that probably philosophically are important. I'd still like to ask you what the underlying uh, moral justification for it is, because we've got the constitutional justification. I'm a Canadian, I think that's what me. But, um, but that's not what I want to ask, actually. Um, I'm, I'm going to put this in the terms of uh, stuff that's going on with Google and, and Facebook, but I'll just go Google right now. Because I, I suspect that if, we, if your first principle, if your moral first principle is love of learning, I suspect that might actually require uh, constraint at, at, at sometimes. Uh, something happened recently with Google this year. Uh, gives me an example. Uh, there was a great uh, story, a couple stories, by The Guardian, uh, how the, this reporter punched in, I think, black people, or women, one or the other, I can't remember, I think it was black people. And the first, like, five suggestions that came up in the Google box was, why are black people so evil? Uh, why are black people such a, a, a problem for the world or whatever? And, and she looked into this, and it was funny, because then the next day, I, I read this, and I got to talk about, my, uh, about this in my class, and when the next day we looked at it, and Google had changed all those um, uh, suggestions in response to the, the story. But what she found was that um, hate groups and white supremacist groups are just spending more money to get their websites to come up first on the first page. Right. And we all know that almost everybody agrees. So my point is that uh, in the vacuum of freedom, the power can swoop in. And uh, if, if the voices that you're getting all the time are, for example, white supremacist voices, if that's filling the first page of Google, that has an effect on the learning mind. To some degree, don't we have to sort of constrain who gets to talk, talk and how much they get to talk in order to? Um, who, who, who gets to talk versus how much they get to talk uh, are, are, are two different issues. Um, just as a, as a quick, you know, um, going back to where, where you started, um, you know, th thank you for, for mentioning that uh, not just folks from Canada would have a different take on this. One, one of the reasons that I um, did a lot with comparative constitutional law uh, in my classes is that American students can't help but fall into the habit of thinking that there's the way in which we do it and then there's the way in which uh, the rest of the world does it which can't really be democratic. Um, and it turns out it's a big old world out there with a lot of different ways of, of, of doing things. Um, and in fact, one of the reasons that my uh, colleague at University College London says, why is this so hard for you, is he wasn't just meaning there's Britain and the rest of the world. In fact, he kind of was meaning there's the rest of the world in the United States. Uh, because Canada and Australia and New Zealand uh, and Britain uh, and France and Germany uh, and Italy and many other Western democracies, industrialized democracies, have no problem punishing or limiting hate speech. Fact is, in Germany today, it is still illegal to fly a swastika. Um, it is not illegal to fly a swastika in the United States, uh, obviously. And I will just tell you as a quick aside, and then I'll come back to your question. Um, I remember giving a talk at a conference over 20 years ago now, um, not long after the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin, 
Um, it was at Hebrew University, and it was about the, con the, uh, the problem of violence conducive speech, not violence inciting speech, which is something different. Violence conducive speech, violence that gives a, uh, a speech that gives a context in which violence is, is acceptable. Uh, what do you do with that? And I uh, and, and various other speakers, particularly um, uh, British speakers actually, took a pro-protection of speech even in that context. Um, interestingly, the Israelis and the Germans were very similar to each other. Those are the two legal systems that had grew up in the shadow of the Holocaust. They had no problem restricting speech in a whole host of contexts. And a German scholar said to me afterwards, you wouldn't have the views you have if there'd been brown shirts marching up and down Fifth Avenue throughout the 1930s and 40s. And my response to him is, you're right. I don't happen to believe the American constitutional system is a trans-contextual system that should be applied in every other context. I think it is the right system for the United States, which is a unique set of circumstances. So one of the reasons that Canada becomes such an interesting example is that it's so similar to the United States in certain ways and so interestingly different in, in others. Uh, and therefore, the, the idea of restricting this kind of speech does not feel like fingernails on the blackboard to you. It's sort of part of the legal culture of, of Canada. Uh, places like Google, obviously, are not, not government restricting speech, so it's an entirely different uh, set of uh, circumstances. It's a little more like what a, what a university president might do in terms of weighing in in a, in a debate. Mind you, I gave examples from campuses where things that the president or the provost or the dean might say. I don't think I'd care for my governor saying that speech is not representing the highest values of our state. I think now you're beginning to move into a much more repressive world. Why is that okay for a university? Well, the university does have a, a, a culture where we could say this is what we stand for. I mean, Valpo has got a set of values that it takes very seriously that represent what this institution is. So now we move to somebody like, um, like Google. Is, is Google doing this out of values? Well, they partially are. Google says that we have an algorithm that's designed to provide information to people in the way in which we think is the best for a functioning uh, democracy. So our algorithm is not working if it can be gamed. So we're going to change our algorithm and we're going to, we're going to work on that to try to make sure that certain things do and certain things don't uh, appear. And defamatory language will not appear. Um, and to a certain extent, hateful language, they may say will not appear because that's the values of, uh, of, of Google. Now, let's move that over to the university. Do we want the president saying on a university campus, you can't say these things? I mean, I would find that problematic for the way in which a university functions. But I think Google becomes a, a major non-governmental source of information and, and is permitted to make those kinds of decisions. What's making Google make those decisions? Partially it's who they are and what they think is is, is best for providing information to society. Part of it is they're getting a lot of help. They're getting a lot of pressure from a lot of different sources of people who are pushing them on all sides. And they look at the neo-Nazis who say, leave it alone, let us do whatever we want to do. And they look at Southern Poverty Law Center and Anti-Defamation League and others, um, human rights um, campaign, who were saying this is outrageous. And Google says, you know, net, net, we don't want to be on the side that where the first thing that comes up is hateful, despicable stuff. So that's their version of the president of the university saying, we're not gonna, this doesn't represent our values. Google says, what's on the front page kind of represents what we're about, so we're gonna jimmy what's not on the front page. Google said, we're gonna take it off altogether, or we're not gonna let certain sources at all be on, that becomes more problematic. You had a question. So that they're doing some kind of action that disrupts the learning environment, 
then the faculty member has a right to do something about it. And, um, and my question has to do with anything you want to say about that, but also um, at what point does somebody, and I know this is not a new question, free speech, free expression, silence other people. And, and, and watching, in our case, like Alaska Native students may never come back to a classroom where somebody said something, did something, and the professor didn't do enough. We have, what, a couple hours? A couple hours more? Um, re re really important questions. Let, let's start sort of in the, in the micro on the first one. Um, what constitutional lawyers would call a time, place, and manner distinction can always be made where you could say, this, this is a kind of, um, of, of um, expressive activity that, that can't happen in the classroom. So, you know, you, you take the easy examples, sort of take it out of the hot button context that you're talking about. Students who decide they want to, you know, um, a demonstrator hang, uh, hold up placards in the middle of a class. Uh, you, you, you're, you're, as a faculty member, certainly free to say, this is a class on biochemistry, you can't disrupt my class, and I'm, this is what we're going to cover today, um, and therefore you're not allowed to do this, and at some point they'll actually be taken out and, and kept from doing that. You know, we talk about no restrictions on speech. Uh, can we step back for a second? Isn't that kind of what we do in our classrooms all the time? Somebody asks a question, you say, that, that's a good question, that's not really what we're covering today. Let's talk about that offline. We'll, we'll talk about, we're talking about something else. I mean, don't we make those kind of decisions all the time? So on that level, you get to control your classroom. What you couldn't do is say, not only can you not do this in my classroom, but you can't do it out on campus either, you can't do it on the quad, etc. cetera. Um, in terms of the when does speech run into other people's uh, feelings and silence other people, th this, this is a tough one. Um, I mean, I'll tell you where, where I stand on this. Um, I, I do think that the answer to uh, even bad speech for the moment and assuming it's bad speech. And in some cases, it's not bad speech. I mean, there are, I've, been, I've had classroom discussions on affirmative action where, frankly, if the temperature were not hot in the room, I would think the kids didn't care. So, I, so I'm glad that it feels a little uncomfortable, not because I just like to provoke people for the fun of it, but because these are hard issues. And, and, and we do have skin in the game if we're, if we're members of the university community, and we do care about this stuff. So that's okay. Uh, in, in, a, in a civil way. And sometimes you say things you wish you hadn't said and then you say, I'm sorry. Right? That, that's part of what we're educating them for also. Um, so there are things that students are gonna say that are gonna make other students uncomfortable and that, in my view, is part of an education. Um, you know, my own take, sort of this, this quickly goes into the trigger warning discussion. Um, I always sort of bristle at the, at the sort of uh, uh, strict idea that says, you know, trigger warnings are anathema to, to, to free expression. I think it sort of depends what you mean by a trigger warning. You know, for, for years I taught a basic course in criminal law. One of the things you do in criminal law, routinely the hardest thing you do in the class uh, is, is the, uh, the crime of rape and specifically uh, acquaintance rape. You know, rape by an assailant whom you know. Um, domestic violence, date rape, um, acquaintance rape generally. Did I give a trigger warning? I don't know, I didn't think of it as that. I'll tell you how I always began every one of those classes, and that's because I thought this is what it means to be a professor who's in charge of her or his classroom. I always said, you know, as opposed to every other crime we've done over the course of the year, this one is gonna be real for many, if not most of the people in the room. I guarantee you with 85 people in the room, 100 people in the room, whatever it was in that class, that at least one of you, unless something very unusual has happened in this student body selection, at least one of you is a, victim, and at least one of you is likely an accused perpetrator, and I'll guarantee you that many, if not most of you, are no more than one degree of separation from a victim and a perpetrator. So let's be sensitive on this, folks. That's it. What did that take, 45 seconds? I, and I never felt I was giving a trigger warning. I felt like I was being a professional in my classroom, because it would be inappropriate to deal with this subject without laying that as a foundation. So when people say no trigger warnings, it seems to me on some level they mean don't exclude material, don't say we're not going to teach the crime of rape because it will upset some people. Fine, I would have a problem with that too. But if they mean don't set a context, I don't, I don't know about you, I can't teach that way. I kind of think that's what we do for a living. Yes?
that, that's going to that's going to turn into a pretty hard line to draw sometimes, because sometimes they're going to say the kind of conversation that I'm trying to create is a discordant conversation. I think. I think on that one, in most of those cases, I'm going to wind up going with Justice Brandeis, that the answer is going to be more speech, not enforced silence. Um, I, I think, but I want to say a little more than that. I, I think many of us have felt, because these issues are so hard, that you'd best stay out of them. And I think there's no, there's no place for that. I think we're in them whether we want to be or not. And I think the failure to speak in response to this kind of activity is itself taken as a kind of tacit approval if for most of us who are in positions where we're being watched for that. So I think there is a moral obligation to, uh, to respond um, in, in the case of those who are seeking to, to disrupt. If they're seeking to cause actual harm, uh, then I think we have a different role that we can play. But otherwise, I think we get into very dangerous territory when we start telling people what they, what they can and can't do in that regard. I, I do think that one of the advantages of speaking about it publicly, Brandeis's moral obligation to, to, for, for better speech, is it also brings these issues up to a more um, overt level and a more conscious level in the society. And I guess I do still hope that in that discussion that, that civility will tend to, to win out. Um, we're living through a time when there are a lot of counterexamples. And I don't mind telling you that you know, my, uh, my, my uh, beliefs have been, uh, I won't say shaken to their core, I will say severely tested uh, and continue to be severely tested. But for the time being, I, I, I stay with, with my first principles on that. Um, and that doesn't mean they don't get reevaluated and, and checked. I guess false viability applies to that too. And right now, there's some falsifiable information coming in, isn't there? So, um, so I think it's, it does require us to keep, keep reevaluating. The manslaughter case, that, that's a, a, a longer discussion. I will just tell you that uh, watch that case continue up on appeal. Because it seems to me that that's a, to me, that's a good example of a, of a terrible thing happens that somebody could have played a more constructive role in. And there probably should be some response to that calling that manslaughter one of the most serious criminal charges there is strikes me as probably wrong, probably excessive. Not every solution has, a criminal, has an answer in the criminal law. Right? As someone who's practiced in the area of bias crimes for decades, um, I have no illusions. I like to think what I do is important, but I have no illusions. The real answers to hate in this country will not come from the punishment of hate. They will come from the practice of love. And that's not something lawyers get to write about. Um, but we better find it. We better figure out how to do that too. At the same time as we're talking about the other stuff. Another hand. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, the question of how, how should the university overall respond, um, you know, this, the answer to the what happens when Richard Spencer shows up, it seems to me in part, is uh, you make sure that he uh, agrees to take questions. Not allowed, at least I would say, you're not allowed to just come to a university campus, give your talk, and then split. You gotta agree to take questions. Um, when we had some borderline speakers come to our campus, and I would get pressure, how can you let so-and-so speak on campus? And I would say, you gotta trust my kids. They'll, it, it, it'll be in a context where they can ask questions. If it's not in a context where they can ask questions, that's an entirely different story. You know, captive audiences, that's an entirely different story. But if it's a normal lecture, they gotta be willing to take questions and that can be answered. Your point takes it a step further, which is that the day after that, when you get, around, when you get back together and you say, okay, what just happened on this campus? You know, what, what else should we do besides letting them take questions? Do we do some kind of um, programs uh, required or otherwise that open up people to these experiences? Yeah, I think that's, that's part of the educative mission of the university. 
I mean, I can tell you in the bias crime world, one of the few things we found that actually worked in terms of rehabilitation of bias criminals, I regret to tell you adult bias criminals, the results are pretty bad, um, but juvenile bias criminals, sometimes you actually do see real change. Um, and a lot of it is not rocket science stuff. It's stuff like uh, uh, interracial basketball teams, you know, where you're soccer teams, you're just sort of forced to rely on the other fellow who's from a different background um, in, an, in an area that you know about and it just can change your, your activity. So um, yeah, I think that becomes important. Um, look, part of what you just asked is the core reason we believe in diverse student bodies. Because we think that the learning is different in the classroom. We think when it comes from the front of the room out, it has certain power but certain limitations. What happens on the other side of the podium is usually vastly more significant that way. You know, and I'll, I'll broaden your question out. I think the, uh, the electronic media generally makes all of these issues more complicated. I'm, I'm not yet ready to say, and it's all fundamentally different, because in fact, you look back on um, free expression law, and, and every time there's been a technological change, the assumption was this changed everything. Right, the telephone, telegraph, all of a sudden you can threaten people without having to be in proximity to them. And so, you know, is it all different, or is this just a continuum? I, this one feels different, and I can't tell if it feels different because it really is different, or it feels different because we're living through it, so it's a little, little harder to know. Um, some of these cases, um, commun uh, threats communicated electronically, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's harder to figure out who sent it, but it's not harder to figure out what the intent was. Um, but some of them, it does become much more complicated because it happens so fast, uh, and it's so easy to make it uh, more diverse uh, in terms of how widely something spreads. Uh, the, um, look, the case I told you about with the, uh, the, the young woman, whom I criticized too, publicly, um, but I, I like to think that I criticized her in a serious civil way that asserted the values of the university. She got inundated with the kind of email traffic <clears throat> that most of you can either imagine or I hope can't quite imagine uh, because it quickly goes to the violent and the violent is, is uh, sexualized and, uh, and racialized in an appalling way, um, and because of the world in which we live, if, if it's on your, you know, your, 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 on your Twitter, on your Facebook, in your in email uh, box, it's, it's in your space. You can't shut the door to it the same way unless you shut yourself off, which is actually what she did. She shut down her accounts. Well, that's fine, but that's sort of the high-tech equivalent of not leaving your room. Right? That, that's sort of being in shutdown mode. So I think, um, I think these, these issues do become vastly more complicated. I think the methodology is still the, the right way to think about it, and in some cases we still get relatively clear answers, but sure, sometimes it's gonna be, it's gonna be much harder. Look, I think we have just begun to think about the seriousness of social media on this. I'll tell you my, my favorite uh, prosaic example of how, how serious a challenge it, it uh, presents. Used to be that when students went off on break, let alone in the summertime, they really were out of each other's space. And that had a salutary effect. You take 18 to 22 year olds, where there's a lot of stuff going on, mentally, hormonally, lots of stuff is happening, and we are challenging them, and we are pushing them, and by design, we put them in proximity with people of different views and different backgrounds. Well, not so surprisingly, that's gonna lead to all sorts of sparks flying. So they need some time away from each other, and they used to get that. They don't get that anymore. They go away on break and they're still socially networked up. This, this is not healthy. 
And uh, this is the part where I'm supposed to say to you, and the answer is, yeah, I don't have the answer is. Um, but this is a concern that we need to think about. You know, how do we find spaces where they can just, just chill, just like not be in each other's spaces for a little bit? Um, or do those spaces exist anymore? I mean, and this, is a, this is a big challenge that we have to work on. So technology generally, I think, has presented many, many challenges for us. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you for your time.